So, yeah, thanks for coming. Um, basically, uh, this is the Android graphics uh, uh, microconference. Um, I guess uh, uh, just want to do a quick intro. Basically, uh, uh, going to try to have more of a discussion, kind of minimize uh, uh, presentations as much as possible just to give enough context for a discussion um, and try to get to the point where we can uh, uh, decide on, uh, you know, potential solutions uh, uh, for things that might be able to go upstream. Um, I guess so uh, this is sort of the schedule up there over there. We've got everything fairly snug, um, so uh, uh, I'm going to try to keep to it as best we can. Um, there's a few things that we might run long into the tea break and that sort of thing, but hopefully we'll be okay with that. Um, other than that, just basically, uh, yeah, uh, I guess we'll start off. Um, I, if, should we do a quick round of folks who might be speaking? Just to, yes. yeah, so I don't know. If you, if you just maybe say your name, who you work for, that sort of thing, if you're going to be commenting. I'm Greg Heckman. Um, I'm from Google. I work on the Android systems team and do display. I'm Eric Gilling. I also work at Google on the Android systems team. I work on display and GPU. I'm Martin Lockwurst. I work on, I work for Canonical and I work on the hybrid graphics for like Intel, NVIDIA stuff. Stuff like that on desktop. I'm Rob Clark, Red Hat, uh, Linux, Graphics, Mesa, DRM, KMS. Hi, Tom Cooksey. I work for ARM um, on Mali uh, graphics integration driver stack stuff. I'm Jesse Barker. I also work for ARM uh, system software graphics leaning considerations. <clears throat> I'm Laurent Panchard. I'm uh, uh, Linux kernel consultant and for Renesis, I work on KMS and Video for Linux. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ross Alford. I work for Broadcom, but I'm also seconded to Lenaro in the graphics team. Anybody else in the second row is likely to speak? Oh, I'm John Stoltz, yes. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> I'm just going to stand around and be confused. Um, so yeah, so I guess first up uh, we've got is Sync, and Eric's going to give just quick background on uh, the Android Sync uh, infrastructure, and then hopefully we can get in some discussion with Martin and others uh, uh, on semantic differences between uh, the DMA buff sync, or fences. All right. Can everyone uh, hear me? Yeah. Back. Get some knots. All right. So I'm going to try and blow through this real quick. Um, if I, uh, I'm going too quick, uh, stop me. If you have any questions, raise your hand. Um, so starting, some of you might have seen this before, uh, with an overview of the Android graphics pipeline. Um, this is sort of a high level picture of what we have. Um, and between all our clients, we have this thing called buffer queue, which is just two queues where a uh, consumer acquires a free buffer, renders into it. Uh, sorry, a producer dequeues a free buffer, renders into it, queues it back up, a consumer of it then acquires it, uses it, and returns it back. Um, the service flinger is our compositor, so it sits between all of your other clients and your display, and for all intents and purposes, it's just another GL client uh, to do its heavy lifting. Um, oh, there's a slide missing from this. Uh, Hardware Composer. Uh, and so this started as a way of accelerating composition of Surface Flinger uh, using things like overlays and 2D blitters. Um, and it's become a place where we've consolidated all things display in uh, Android. So uh, that all looks great. Why do we need sync? And I think it's important to sort of say, you know, give some ground rules for what we're doing. And if every buffer gets queued after it's finished, uh, then you're not exploiting any parallelism between your CPU, your GPU, and your display. Um, and in order to get decent performance, especially on these mobile devices. That's, that's key. Um, so why implicit sync? Or why not implicit sync? Um, so from Honeycomb through, I think, ICS, uh, Ice Cream Sandwich versions, we had an implicit synchronization contract. And there were some problems with that. Uh, first, we were really bad at explaining what that contract was. Uh, second. Uh, our partners were really bad at implementing our poorly described contract. And third, because it distributed all 
the sort of enforcement of that contract into the drivers, into the libraries, into the clients, uh, it meant that it was really difficult to change that contract. Um, so we wrote a sync framework. Um, and the primary motivation to this is to take all of the synchronization contract, build it around a couple simple rules that are easy to uh, implement in your drivers and your clients, and then consolidate the contract into uh, Service Flinger, comp a Composer, and all of its associated machinery. Um, and so, digging in a bit more into the meat, um, there's no actually code in these slides, uh, but the building blocks we're building on is you have a sync timeline, and it can just be thought of a line monotonically, or the values monotonically increasing in time. Um, Generally, you have one per driver context. So we've seen every GL context ends up getting assigned a timeline. Um, and this is where your driver-specific operations. So this is the thing with like an op structure and with all your uh, function callbacks and stuff. Um, and I've provided a uh, CPU-based one that's just based on weight queues and you know general kernel synchronization primitives. Um, Attached to those timelines are synchronization points. And so if you have a, time, a line, these are points on that line. Um, and everything in this line is strictly ordered. Um, so if you see up there, if you advance to 18, um, if you advance the timeline to 18 to say I'm done with 18's work, it also means you're done with 16's work. Um, they, they start active and will transition once to either signaled or an error state. Um, yeah, because of this advancing timeline. Uh, and then we bubble up one more level to the actual uh, primitive that we build our synchronization contract around. And this is the sync fence. And it's merely just an aggregate of sync points, which can be from different timelines. And so this is the thing that Surface Flinger uses to, go ahead. No. Uh, you asked if it's possible to create a loop? Uh, no, because um, it's not on this slide. It's on the next one. But a fence, well, first, uh, a, a fence can't refer to itself. Mm -hmm. right? A fence is just a collection of points, and points exist on timelines. So all the arrows travel one direction. Secondly, when you um, get to it, merge a fence, so when you're trying to aggregate these points together, um, you, uh, you copy those points. Or is there another loop you're talking about? No, like you create another fence and there's like 18 and 5 in there. And then put them together. Would that be possible? Well, uh, yeah, so you, could, so you create a fence with 18 and 5. So now you have two fences representing two separate mm -hmm. dependencies yeah. or two separate sort of completion events. But um, now, sure, if you have, if you tell the thing that's going to advance the timeline to 18 to wait on the thing that advances to 15, you know, you, yes, you'll, you'll get a deadlock, but, you know, any, any locking scheme, if you do the wrong thing, you get a deadlock. And, um, and this is not a problem from the way we've implemented it. Do you only, do you only get the edge? Sorry. You only actually get the uh, um, sync points after you've queued the work. So you, if it's in the queue, you know it's going to complete. So you can't get deadlocks. Um, unless you. Yeah, I mean, I you think you'd, you'd, you'd have it. to. You'd, we'll get onto the implementation of a driver in just a second. Or, no, I think I skipped over that slide. But the, the idea is that these fences are promised by the kernel of work being done. So you get them as a result of queuing up work into the kernel. And then you, you give it a set of dependencies, and it gives you back a fence, which is the promise of work done. So I think, though, I mean, what happens if the process of queuing up work requires that you create more work with fences? I mean, this is the sort of can, thing that can comes Can you give me an example? Well, the desktop drivers with VRAM, you know, queuing up some work might, or a guard, you might have to move you might have to evict something else, which depends on a fence, in order to move something in, which depends on a fence. So, I mean, that's, 
that's kind of where the like the wound weight mutex stuff comes in to solve. Right. So I, I, I think of of that's more of a constraint solving problem. Um, yeah. And is it so is it uh, and you know I I haven't dealt with anything with VRAM. So um, we we did deal with the Tyler on TI, which was and yeah, the Gart and Nvidia, was, which are sort of similar. Uh, yeah, uh, concepts. You've got a limited Tyler resource of how you can map things in. Pretty static. <laughs> What's that? I said the way Tyler was used on Android was fairly static. Right. So is there, is there a case where you've queued up work to be done and it's allocated a bunch of VRAM and then you queue up another piece of work and it's going to stall the first job in order to get the second job accomplished? No, but the other way around can happen usually. Well, it depends a bit. Like, it might be possible if you have like multiple execution contexts. Like, Nvidia has three th jobs that can run at the same time. So, but I'm, you. I'm sorry, I didn't. I you didn't implicitly understand. sync. You explicitly sync them before, so that doesn't really happen with some per object locking. Can you want to draw a picture? I'm still not following you. Uh, no, that's basically. <laughs> oh, great. Now you have been. Yes. If nobody draws anything out of order, Darwin will point. Well, it's a bit hard to explain, but then. On desktop, you can have like multiple buffers, A, B, and C, and they mm -hmm. can be used in multiple operations at the same time, multiple cards. So, in that case, you cannot really, ac you might end up with a dependency if you don't explicitly order them. And that's why basically what I've been solving with the weight round mutexes. So, that someone can take this one and someone can take this one separately. Right. And then have an order in which they appear. And then with the fences, then you signal that the first one is done and then. The second one can start when this one is done. So if they both use the same buffer, it doesn't create a problem. Um, and and so, uh, is it is it is it the case that you've submitted this job first and this one? Well, second, you could. But you then, but then this job ends up kicking off. Yeah. Like like like, are they, do these complete out of order with job submission into the kernel? Mm -hmm. Yes. Like well, I would assume that a GPU, each GPU, so a GPU, for each GPU, for each context, you have a timeline. Sort of, yes. Well, I mean, that's, I'm stating that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, 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 presumably, this job on, a, on, that's on this GPU is not going to have any ordering guarantees with this one, and therefore, there's no problem. Well, timelines. you can imagine the case where there's like the user space uses this GPU to first render the buffer and then you use the second GPU to display it on the screen. So it copies it over after it's done and user space cannot see when it happens. So the implicit ordering has to be done inside the kernel itself. Um, well, in, in, in Android, uh, rendering and display are split up. Mm -hmm. um, so, are you are you are you are, th are you talking about like a uh, like a flip um, that's happening as part of a command stream on like an Nvidia card? Yeah, for for example, um, and then the rendering is done on Intel or something like that first. So that well, if the rendering is done on Intel, you you will have gotten. Um, I mean, how do you how, how do you automatically make a flip happen between? without any software intervention between an Intel and, a G and an NVIDIA card? Well, in NVIDIA has like an op that you can use for it, and you can map the Intel status page to it. So it's possible. I've been doing a demo with that. I don't know if I have it up currently, but it was working. So it, it's possible. But um, Well, so per presumably, you would submit the work to the GPU, and you'd get a fence back. Yes. Right? And then you'd submit the work to the display, and you'd pass that fence. Yeah. And if the display knew about the internal format and the driver mm -hmm. of the rendering job, it could then pull the data it needs out of that fence and then yes. program the display. 
and that's what's been happening. Right. So, but yes, so, so, it's, so that's supported in the system. Um, I, I, it's not currently supported, but I, I had a proof of concept working for it. Right, but I, I, that, that was one of the use cases. Now, mind you, it was for, like from an NVIDIA GPU to an NVIDIA display engine. But one of the use cases I considered and one of the reasons why there's uh, driver-backed timelines mm -hmm. is the fact that you can have driver-private data in them. And if you know about the specific implementation, you can dig into that, get the data you need to queue up a hardware dependency. Yeah, but except what we do is we attach the fence to the object itself. So they, so from that you know what what the format is already. You can see it. You can read the data from the fence itself. Well, I mean, whether or not the, I mean, that's a much larger issue of whether or not you're attaching the the fence to the buffer or the operation. But yeah. But at the end of the day, it's the same thing. It is. <laughs> so that's the main difference, I think, between the DMA buffer approach I was using. I see. I don't think that case is really, really the issue. I mean, where the wound weight mutex stuff comes in is if you're submitting a batch and it references 200 objects, you don't want to like evict an object that you depend on, or you don't want to, another context that's submitting a job to um, evict something that you're going to depend on. So you want to order. But I, I guess, right. I mean, I guess by having a strict order per ring. You know, it's only per context, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the thing I'm And And I, I mean, I, I, I don't see this as solving the same problem as. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's probably not. And, and you'd probably use both in a system where you are constrained on like, GPU memory. Right. I'm wondering what happens when you have multiple rings for things sharing the same guard, for example. But, I mean, maybe that's getting a little bit off the topic. Um, so, well, but so, yeah, anyways. Uh, right, so this is about the, the promise of the kernel um, work being submitted. And for timely, like, in terms of the display, uh, timely is the next frame shows up. So it could be hours later, but, you know, it's, it's a finite amount of time. Um, the, the, the nice thing about thinking of a, the synchronization as a promise of work done is it completely sidesteps the issue of read and write operations, as those are sort of implicit in the work that you're submitting. And it's really easy to, from the compositor standpoint, it's really easy to chain these operations together. And so there's no need for like read slots and write slots and stuff like that. I mean, it is kind of useful to have read and write slots um, just because, like, if you uh, need to map a buffer for CPU access for read access and it's pending a read operation on the, G on the GPU, there's no point to stall. Um, but it, maybe that's a different well, I, problem I mean, from what this is. It, it, I, think, I, I, I think that's a different problem. That, um, that, I'm, not, I'm not sure that that's like. So, so with fences, you, you just wouldn't, you wouldn't block a read operation on the fence? Well, you'd, yeah, you'd, the, the you'd, policy is defined by user space. Do I want to block on this fence or not? Um, if I've been told this is a, 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 a fence for something that's big and read from it, then I know if I'm also going to read from it, then I, I don't need to block on that fence. I only need to block on the previous right, right fence. Uh, but, you know, that's just user space policy, and it's up to user space to figure that out. It's yeah. not, not it's communicated down into kernel. Right. But the property can also be different because some of the buffers you might read from at the same time as one you're writing to. So it's not really a property of the fence itself. It's more of a property of the object on which the fence is attached. Sure, and this doesn't touch any of the objects. This is simply a mechanism to allow the user space to not do a stupid thing and fight whilst the reads in the very place. Well, it also lets the kernel not do a stupid thing because you're, you're, you're communicating those dependencies to the kernel. 
Yeah, so it's user space telling the kernel not to do something stupid by, by describing the dependencies. Right. But the, yeah, user space has got to know what that fence does, uh, is for and how, whether it should wait on it or not. But none of this describes that policy. This is just a mechanism that user space can tell the kernel about this so that um, it, it can enforce that the policy that user space is specifying. And it, means that, it, and it means that these read-write semantics don't have to be implemented by every driver. Right. right. So I'm, I'm, guessing, I'm guessing this is mainly used for things that what sits on top of GLCs as buffers and things that are shared rather than like internally buffers created by Right. I, I mean, I, it's, it's, it's not our goal to control what the GL driver is doing between itself. Okay. Uh, we, within a context. However, between contexts, we want to control the flow of those buffers. Right, um, okay. And, and there's, there's now a, a KHR native fence um, EGL extension. EGL or GL? All right. So, so, the, so there's a way to represent uh, dependencies in your GL command stream as uh, native as fences like this. Yeah, but it could be done inside the kernel as well if you're sharing the buffers to DMAPA, for example. Not necessarily. So that requires the kernel driver to know what memory objects are going to be touched by that job. That is true of the open source MESA drivers. It is not true of all drivers. And, and that's the, the, the critical thing that why I think sync works quite well for us because we don't have to tell our kernel driver what uh, uh, buffers uh, job's going to touch because we have a very large um, MMU VA and everything fits in it always and then some. If, if we had to, in user space, figure out all of the objects that a job could possibly touch which, by the way, gets really quite complicated with some of the, the GLES 3 use cases. Um, it's a lot of CPU overhead in user space to actually figure out what buffers are going to get touched, stick them all in a big list, and then chuck them down into the kernel driver, and then have the kernel driver have to iterate through all of those buffers to say, is anybody else using this? 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 Um, whereas all of that goes away if you've got a, a single fence, because you just say, well, I'll tell the kernel space, you need to wait for this external thing to happen. And job's done. And, and we're, we're, we're not trying to solve, we're also not trying to solve like mapping or cache um, with this, though, you know, maybe in the future there, there'd be a way that you could combine this with DMA buff or, you know, when we were originally imagined this ion to help automate some of your, your caching and mapping issues. But to speak to what Thomas was saying, um, a member of our team that used to work at a different company working on a GL driver for a different operating system went down exactly the route that Thomas is describing of trying to manage and pin all the buffers that were going in at submission time. And it was a huge task to, to make that performant. Um, and I can't remember whether or not he said they ended up doing that. Um, so if you can get if you can get away with that over without that overhead, it's a big win. Well, usually between passes, you, you only share one or two buffers, so th those are the ones you need need to annotate, not all the buffers that you are currently using. Right, right, and so and so you would only have fences for the buffers you're sharing. Yes, like, like this. So. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think every GL driver has a different way of expressing that dependency internally. Yeah, come on.
So the reason I think that none of the Mesa guys are seeing this as a problem is because usually always run on really big CPUs, and so the the CPU overhead of doing that is pretty small compared to you know even uh, doing all of that checking on an Atom or an ARM CPU or any of the the smaller embedded CPUs. It's pretty painful, but on a core or a fast AMD CPU, it's it's just noise. So I think that's why all the Mesa guys are like, I don't see the problem of doing all this checking. We do it all the time. And, and well, I, think that's I mean, why. so the other vendor on the other operating system I was talking about was running on a a, a big, you know, okay. big core. So I, and I and I don't know the details about that, so, so I can't so like we'll passionately argue that um, he wasn't wrong. Right. So on a, on a lot of uh, at least our older older GPUs, we had a really small. Um, you know, comparatively small uh, address space for the for the GPU, so we we were forced to do to do this checking to make sure that everything would fit, and so we could try to batch things up larger. You know, batch it up as large as will fit in the address space, and if it's too big, then try to try to back off and, and send smaller batches. Um, and it's a couple percent, but it's not it's not the worst thing that happens in in the driver for us. So, but yeah, I mean that's that's again sort of driver and implementation specific, and and I and I think that kind of dependency will always be driver and implementation specific. Now the question is, what happens when, you know, like you're you know, on all of these ARM SOCs, the display is a completely separate entity, except for maybe a Tegra if you want to think about it like that. Completely separate entity from the GPU. So on like a desktop card where the, the, the display is tightly integrated, the GPU, you don't have to like, worry about sort of the, the complete like, cross-driver synchronization between the two. Um, and, and, and here you definitely have to, and then when you get into th things like 2D blitters, uh, color converters, and stuff like that that you know, have their own drivers, um, having a common primitive to, uh, to talk between them is necessary. Well, it looks pretty similar, the, except the fences are done on the DMA buffs themselves, so they can be shared across other objects, and you have to lock the, all the buffers you're using if the weight rounds mutexes. So basically, you first lock all your mutexes, and sometimes you get a raise and you have to back off a bit, and then wait a bit until it's until you can grab it, and then grab all the other mutexes again. So it might be a bit slower sometimes when there's concurrency, but. Yeah, I think, I mean, we did talk about this a long time back, and I think the conclusion was, like, so the implicit sync and explicit sync are not necessarily mutually exclusive. I mean, the difference is the implicit sync needs to get punched through a bunch of APIs. So, you know, page flip needs to be able to take a, a sync object. You know, V4L, Q, and DQ buff need to take a sync object. Right, um, and, and, and the thing you trade for doing that is a consolidation of the synchronization contract. Right. Which, which so is, I, is of I, paramount I, importance to us on Android. Yeah. I mean, I... I th uh, the, the, the thing you gain from adding synchronization explicitly to these kernel APIs is a consolidation of the, the synchronization contract into a single piece of code. Yeah. So, I mean... It's extremely important for Android. It's extremely important. I mean, right. I, I think it's extremely I mean, important to anybody who would ever want to change that contract. Right. I mean, my thinking is that I'm not against adding, you know, QBuff with sync object, page, ob page flip with sync object, and so on, um, as long as it allows the implicit sync mechanism to continue to work for user space that uses that. I mean, it's better to have one kernel API that two different user spaces can sit on than to fork the kernel yeah. API. So, so, so currently, if you pass um, negative one as your sync file descriptor, um, that, that currently, in, in our view, means that the buffer's already ready. Okay. Um, 
I could see a world where if you pass a negative one, it means the buffer is already ready as long as there's not a sync object attached to the DMA buff. Right. I mean, that's. I think we can do something like that. Um, but then, the, then, then, then the the like, you you would still want the same synchronization object to be backing both the one attached to the DMA buff and the one attached to um, and the one attached that you're passing in. Right. And and you would want like and you would and, and you would want not to be implementing the policy in your drivers, otherwise you've now created a mess for the explicit sync yeah. case. Well, I think, I mean, the fence is somewhat similar to maybe the lower parts of sync. I mean, it's got the same state model of not signaled or transition to signaled, or I think also error. Uh, are we, yeah, OK, yeah. We originally had. I think error cancel and then decided that made it GPU lockup recovery to Harry. Um, um, so we just treated it like signaled. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we found that as a way of reporting, a good way to report GPU lockup yeah. um, as a way that got exposed to user space. Why couldn't you run this job because it's dependence, fence, signal error? Right. Or back to places. Right. I mean, they, the problem is. We can conceivably do the fence weight on the hardware. So we can have the hardware weight on a semaphore, for example. And unwinding that is ugly. I think that's the reason why we originally dropped it. I mean, yeah, that's probably something like that. So if you have like the fence being weighted on hardware, you have to signal it one way or the other. So you might be able to say it's You can't, you can't shoot the GPU in the head at that point? <laughs> I mean, I mean, because 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 there, there's no other yeah. possible thing to do at that point. Well, you can say, yeah, you you just say indeed it's completed, and then it's writing on some or reading from some memory that's bogus. But that's not really an issue, and it's easier than completely killing the CPU, GPU, and then restarting it again. I mean, there, might be other rendering. there might be other rendering that's queued up that is valid. Yeah, but um, well, but. Okay, so so, but so, I mean, so, I, so, so there might be a rendering that is depend that's not dependent on the error buffer. Yeah, I mean, I what I would say is, cancel should just be signaled with a error flag, and user space can see there's the, you know, there was an error bit set on the fence. You know, right. I mean, you could do the same thing by having whatever is waiting on the the fence. You know, so it's so at that point it has to be backed by some sort of hardware primitive or knowledge about what you're writing in some piece of memory. Um, right. So then the error condition from the hardware standpoint looks like a signal, and then mm -hmm. uh, when you when you get to returning that job to user space, you would do like a poll of all the all the fences, and if there's an error signal, then you propagate that error through your. Mm -hmm. And 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 give, given this flow, you know, there's that there's a lot of code in my sync stuff just to implement a debug UF, debugfs interface, um, and and to allow uh, a driver to call in and dump the state of mm -hmm. the fence, and that's proven indispensable at tracing down dependency issues. Um, yes. Yeah, so the implicit sync. Um, we um, implemented something similar. We called it the kernel dependency system KDS. It's what's used on the Chromebook. That also adds a uh, essentially a last reader, last writer um, to DMA buff. Um, not on the Chromebook. That was fairly easy to, to, to debug because there's just one full screen window and it's, it's not too complicated. But from on other customer platforms where we've used it, it's been horrendous to figure out why did this job not run, or why did this job run when it shouldn't have done? Um, because, it, yeah, it's very difficult to, after the fact, pull out the information of what had happened um, in order to have the buffers locked 
um, to, to prevent other things progressing. And it, okay, it was driver bugs, so they, you know, you can just say, well, there was bugs. That's why bad things happened. But actually, trying to figure out why those bugs happened was very difficult. Whereas with Sync, you get a, you know, 32 character text string to say who created the the fence, and it very makes things much easier. Well, for the stuff I've been working on, you. You have to lock all the buffers with the weight volume detector stuff. And one of the nice things about that is if you enable proof locking, you can immediately see that you did, didn't do anything stupid, like forgetting to lock a buffer or not, and forget to unlock all the buffers. Yeah, but, so. but, but some of the stupid things you could do is, you know, you could not be giving another uh, buffer. Like, like, your, like your, your app could not be submitting more buffers. And then, you know, at some point the display has a problem because, because now it can't get another buffer and can't make a vSync guarantee or, you mm -hmm. know, there's... Um, if you forget to do an unlocking buffer, you get an error from forgot to unlock a buffer before, unlock a lock before going back to user space and the kernel panics out at that point. So you cannot really do that if you have proof locking enabled. Well, but what if you want to hold, like, like, you want to hold the lock on, yeah. like, like, like these aren't synchronous operations. So you, you want no. to hold the, the lock on the buffer. Across. No, you, you put in a new fence before when your operation is starting or pending. So. The fencing is, is kind of happens over the course of the submit, and then you drop the, like, the wound weight. Uh, Right. Um, so yeah, you don't actually ever need to hold it across system calls. And that's why the locked up stuff works. But that's um, the well. We're, we're kind of mix, mixing two things. The the wound weight mutex stuff isn't really the fence stuff. Um, it's handling the dependencies. Right. So the wound weight mutex is handling the is everything ready to submit, but it's not really the fence mechanism. So the wound weight mutex has locked up support that can catch a lot of issues of um, people missing you know, mistakes and drivers like missing lock, but that's kind of t separate from fence. So yeah, so, I think it, so it catches people missing yeah. mistakes with sort of like, like resources. Yeah. Like allocation. For this resource in the list of things that need to be locked. Yeah, like like on the like for instance on the Galaxy no, yeah. Nexus where we did where yeah. we had implicit sync, um, the the camera would do something wrong, mm -hmm. um, and and the camera wasn't even supposed to be like in it, in this system, like currently in the current version of Android, um, the, the the camera doesn't have to participate in the synchronization mm -hmm. because uh, it, the, the, we have yet to find a performance gain for that, and because the contract is explicit through the compositor, we can make those decisions. Uh, back in the Galaxy Nexus, anything that touched a buffer had to be cognizant of the, the contract. And so the, the camera and the DSP that was, you know, the ISP that was using the camera, or the DSP that was doing the media buffer would, would fail silently and stop submitting buffers. And then the GPU would fault, mm -hmm. or stop completing buffers, and the GPU would fault and throw you know giant hex dump of stuff that only IMG can decode, and then I get a bunch of bugs that end up you know weeks later being traced down to camera bugs. And with our work on the Nexus 10, where we first implemented this stuff, those kinds of bugs were, were really easy to point to the person that had you know the piece of code that had the problem. Mm -hmm. but Sorry, I think we should try and see how to make sync point 
fit on top of DMA fence um, and so that it can either be attached to an object or done explicitly. I mean, current non-Android user space, it would be too intrusive to plumb explicit sync, sync through the whole stack, so I don't think that will happen, but I don't think it's mutually exclusive with doing explicit sync. Right. Well, I mean, I think even, even yesterday, I forget his name, I was talking about the uh, buffer or the media and composition. I was saying the, compo the compositor at least needed to know when things were signaling. Um, so, um, so, 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 there was, so, so even there, there was the need to have some of visibility in user yeah, space. Yeah, I mean, it would be nice to be able to poll or something like that. And that's, that's something that's not tackled yet with, with DMA fence. And I mean, maybe sync point morphs into the user space facing API on top of DMA fence or something. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, it might morph into the user space API, but I think it's important to preserve the semantics of the ordering and the ability to merge fences, because uh, we now depend on that fairly heavily. I mean, what the compositor really needs is probably just an EGL API to tell me, is this buffer ready yet? Um, well, that's if it's doing EGL. I mean, yeah, you, well, my display uh, doesn't speak EGL. My 2D blitter doesn't speak H EGL. Yeah, OK. So the, I mean, OK, maybe I'm coming at it from a, a Wayland Weston perspective, where it is EGL plus GBM as your native Windows system, which lets you tie to KMS. Um, so it is, you still have an EGL image for every surface, whether you're doing, whether you're compositing it with the GL, with GL or whether you're compositing it with right. something so, else. So, so things are only, in Android, things are only uh, turn into GL primitives, be an EGL image or a handful of mm -hmm. other things that I know we've used at different points when they touch GL. So if, it's, if a buffer is coming from a camera or a video decoder, uh, it will never find its way, hopefully, into GL. Are, are you using this for anything other than buffer object synchronization? Uh, no. Plans, or can you not say um, we, we haven't found a use for it yet, but I mean, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly generic concept that doesn't mean it's tied, that doesn't necessarily tie to buffers, well, but, it was, but it was made, it was designed to synchronize graphics buffers. to be able to do implicit, sorry, at, at, least, for the, uh, at least for the desktop stuff. Um, I mean, I mean a, a, a good place to start might be to make the DMA buff, the thing the DMA buff has as its primitive attached to it, uh, a sync fence. So, so, so the base primitive that you're using for implicit sync is now 100% compatible with what we use on Android because it is what we use on Android. Mm. Um, if, if you guys need to do, like, you can always implement a, uh, a timeline driver to do you know, more complicated things. I know ARM's done that um, for, for their incremental. Well, driver. I didn't see much problem. I didn't see much difference between like, the Android fence and the fence I was working on, so I don't so, think it's so a problem. Why, so, why did you do your thing? <laughs> uh, it's not upstream, so. Well, I mean, it's like. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, like you know, I like so. When is uh when was it February of two thousand of last year? Is was when I posted the first set of the the sync patches that I had, um, and if it's not that much different, then you know. Let's well, it's it's different in concept. Uh, it's m maybe, maybe you intend to use it differently. Yeah, I mean, I, I think 
a big part of it is, yeah, we intend to use it differently. We intend to use it attached to the DMA buff. And also we intend to use it for, to allow for, um, how would you say, hardware synchronization in cases where it's possible with fallback. Oh, that was absolutely a design goal for my. Okay. Uh, that's the reason why you have an op structure in your timeline. And then you, you can, you know, fairly trivially compare that ops pointer and get the private data of the timeline and any points that are attached to it. Yeah, I mean, I. You guys use the same primitives, even though you guys are going to use it in a different way. If you guys can agree on that, then. Then, like, the next step would be trying to figure out commonality and, and, yeah. and method of use versus just I mean, structure of use. Are we looking at? Is, it, is it another interface? Is it. I mean, from what I've looked. Uh, I mean, we don't really have a timeline concept per se. It's more just a fence with fence ops. Um, uh, maybe, maybe it was a different thing I was looking at, but, but there was something that had like a compare operation and a value, but they, but they weren't strictly ordered, so signaling one of the future didn't. Well, it depends. It, it, it's only useful to compare it when it's on the same context, which is similar to the timeline, except. Mm -hmm. so, so, for example, on NVIDIA cars, you can have like a lot of the timelines because there's a lot of hardware context that you can create. So there wasn't really much use of creating an explicit timeline for each of them, so I just put in a number instead for the context. And then the ops, you, you could still use the ops to compare. I think we can use the iron session otherwise. Fine. You could probably continue in the iron session otherwise. Okay. Well, maybe we can continue on then, but I, I, yeah. I want to keep things moving. Um, but uh, yeah, so if, I don't know, hopefully, hopefully uh, you guys continue emailing and working this out because it sounds like it's not that far apart. <laughs>